We now have available this through the magic of Skype. Patrick Byrne, I, I think a, a gentleman, he needs little introduction to, to many of you, but for those who are not as familiar, I'll very briefly, without embarrassing him, talk about uh, a little bit of his background. He is a Wall Street slayer of sorts. Uh, he has gone to bat against uh, some of the nefarious interests in Wall Street and put some of his own skin in the game in that aspect. He not only holds degrees from, uh, tell me if I'm right here, Patrick, from Dartmouth, from Cambridge, and from Stanford. Uh, despite, despite all of that, he came out on the other side just fine. <laughs> he is, of course, an, an internet entrepreneur, and uh, I'm sure many of you, my wife in particular, are available with Overstock.com and all of its many offerings for the house. Uh, he is, but most importantly for our conversation today, he is an early adopter like Caitlin Long, uh, an innovator in the blockchain and Bitcoin space. And again, when we talk about skin in the game, putting his own skin in the game, uh, to, to create, a, a, this term went around earlier today, a nascent company which will allow blockchain technology to make property titles uh, uh, far more dependable and useful uh, all around the world. So that said, please give a big round of applause and welcome to Patrick Byrne. Thank you very much, Jeff. It's a great honor to speak with you and the Mises Institute once again. Uh, okay, I'm, this is Wired Magazine has me, Bitcoin Messiah, and as you've actually already heard, Scourge of Wall Street. Uh, I have something else going for me. I'd like to think that we have a solution to global poverty. Uh, it's based on an insight of an economist named Hernando de Soto, a Peruvian. This is his great insight. Seven and a half billion people on Earth Two-thirds of them do not live in the world as we know it. No formal property rights. So they do. the point is they do own assets, but two-thirds of the world you keep their assets in informal ledgers, not in uh, formal land registries as we know them. And yet, and because of that, there's a market opportunity for businesses like ISIS and Al-Qaeda and FARC and so forth. Because what they do, because these people do not have records to their lands, there's all kinds of things that you and I can do that they can't do, such as what you see on your screen. If they try to get, and so if somebody's living on, in say a favela on a hillside in outside Rio de Janeiro, they may have lived there for four generations. They don't have any piece of paper that says they own that house they live in, but well, because they don't have the piece of paper, of course, they never know if the local generalissimo shows up and says, Senor, that's not your land. That was my grandfather's land and you must leave tomorrow. And so you don't have any incentive to invest. You don't have any piece of paper. You can go and borrow some money against start a fruit stand, start a business. If they try to get formal property rights, it may take 30 years and 200 steps, which means 200 bribes to 200 petty bureaucrats. It's not feasible. Uh, this has led to a lot of problems. Here's one. Groups like Shining Path, FARC, Al-Qaeda, ISIS, what they do is they roll into a town. They're actually quite well organized, ISIS in particular. They, go, they would go into a town and have DMV on a laptop, and they'd have people go around that look at land titles and say, oh, let's see the land title, your certificate to this, to this home you live in. Uh, and if... If you have a, and you may have some informal little certificate of occupancy from a municipal authority or something, they say, well, do you support ISIS? We'll put our stamp on it. And so they get people to support ISIS and they put their chop on it. That's really the business they're in. They're selling protection, a little bit like I happen to be in New York in the moment. And I have a friend who's an entrepreneur here. And she said she was a small business, a small restaurant owner. And she, a few days after she started her business many years ago, a couple guys, a couple rough looking characters show up and say, you know, oh, beautiful restaurant. Boy, it would be shame if anything happened to this. Let me, uh, you know, do something nice for us. And it won't. And she didn't. Three days later, she came in and the whole front of the restaurant was covered in black paint. It's a protection racket. That's really the business that these the terrorist groups are in fundamentally. It also leads to uh, it's led to the Arab Spring. The Arab Spring, 64 people, starting with a guy named Wazuzi in uh, Tunisia, set themselves on fire. 
of the 64, about 35 live. Hernando de Soto went around and interviewed about 18 of them he was able to find. Not a single one of them was an Aluhu Akbar kind of guy. They were all little entrepreneurs. Guy with a fruit stand, Wazuzi in Tunisia was a guy with a fruit stand that, a, that he'd been selling for years out of one st spot in the city market. Nothing's licensed, it's all convention. One day a cop, a female police woman, shows up and slaps him and makes him leave. And he set himself on fire. And that began the Arab Spring that took down all these countries. Well, it turns out it was really a revolution of, of the merchants. It was a revolution that's not specific. It's a revolution of the untitled entrepreneurs. And they were tired of getting their stuff expropriated. And that was the word they used all the time, by the way. They often decried how their capital had been expropriated. These guys, you know, there's all kinds of cell phone videos of the guys who set themselves on fire. And they said things like that. It's amazing. It's, I mean, I shouldn't laugh, but it's odd. It's odd. They're, they're capitalists who were objecting that their capital had been expropriated. They're objecting to no rule of law. Environmental damage, um, commons, results. Uh, this has been a result. Uh, people switch sides. In other words, when people, when poor people get their law, their informal property turned into property, into legal property, they, they have a stake in the system, they switch sides, entrepreneurship starts. This happened, this has happened a couple times. Uh, in Peru, Hernando de Soto had this theory that they could do this. In 1990, for you youngsters out there, there was a, there was a movement in Peru called Sendero Luminoso, the Shining Path. It was a Maoist group, very much like the Khmer Rouge. They scalped people, killed about 70,000 people. And they had 60% of the country. It was, it was, Peru was lost. Peru, Eagleburger, our Secretary of State, said it was the biggest uh, problem in the Western Hemisphere, biggest security threat. Hernando got the U.S. and the government of Peru and with the U.S. banking to go out and they titled every, they went out to, he calls it the Indiana Jones phase of his life. They would go out to these little villages and creeks and get the books of documents turn them into, bring them back to Lima, turn them into real documents, bring them back to the people, give it to them. Everybody switched sides. Within six months, this group that had won 60% of the country collapsed and everybody had to turn themselves in, to, in for protection. Otherwise, the people would lynch them. Uh, it's really the last time the West won a war against terrorism, actually. It led to something of a miracle. Peru's done very well. I know that a lot of we Mises, Miesians like to think talk about Chile. Peru's really done very well in the 28 years since then. Uh, lots of small businesses started up, et cetera. It's a, it's a real gem. Of. Incidentally, this is what we did in Japan after World War II. They had all these feudal ledgers. Uh, that, that is how feudalism worked. And MacArthur went and made it all get turned into real law, real legal system. And we know what happened. So... Now, the problem has been, Hernando wrote his book in 2000, The Mystery of Capital, Why Capitalism Worked in the West and Fails Everywhere Else. Uh, it was never really possible to implement it, though. However, now, due to the magic of things like Facebook and blockchain and digital marketing and mobile apps, we, uh, it is possible to bring that to the world. Uh, I know a place that's really good at blockchain and me digital media and mobile apps. It's Overstock.com. We've won, you know, it's we've won the uh, all kinds of awards for our technology. Hernando and I have gotten together, formed a company, and we have built a an app that lets his thinking finally get implemented. See, that's really always been the take. Great in theory, never got implemented, and then, you know his. His theory was that the West instead should be helping developing countries just build land titling systems. And if you did that, it would unleash far more capital than the West has ever given the developing world in terms of aid and such. It would just get unleashed if we helped them get land titling. It's you know, But there have been different World Bank projects to try to make it happen. They really can't. But now through the combination of these technologies and about... 20 million bucks, we think we can make this happen globally. I think it's really a civilizational moment. We're gonna do, so we've been working on this for some time and I actually expect to have a prototype in the marketplace this, this summer.
I won't name the country, but there is a country and we're going to get it tuned in right there. And then there's other, there's whole continents reaching out that say, will you fly here? When can you get this? I'm saying, let us just get the thing built. But anyway, it's a, it's blockchain based. See, the whole thing is, it's really all about the, the trust aspect. Nobody, people will always say, well, why couldn't you do that with a database? When you get into blockchain, every time you get talking about a business, people say who are against blockchain. So well, why couldn't you have just done that with a database? It's like they miss the point. We want systems where there's not a single point of trust, where there's nothing you got to trust, no corporation you have to trust, no government you have to trust. Uh, that's what blockchain lets us do. In, in crypto, we trust. Uh, let me play. I'm there hoping are additional regulatory changes that this breakdown of the central pillar of competitive markets requires in order to return to stability, particularly in the areas of fraud, settlement and securitization. OK, so Alan Greenspan, uh, this is he referred to settlement when I, when uh, Wall Street collapsed in 2008. Alan Greenspan went before Congress and identified it correctly as a settlement crisis. This is what he meant by settlement. When grandpa is buying stock from a hedge fund, brokers are communicating. And the act of them changing, exchanging stock and cash is settlement. It actually, when I was a kid, this happened on bicycle. Wall Street was filled with guys on bicycles running around with sacks of stock over their shoulders. And they were delivering among the brokers. That's how settlement worked. However, in the 1960s, volume on Wall Street quadrupled and the guys on the bicycles log jammed. Wall Street was actually, there was a period that only the real old timers would remember called the Great Wall Street Paperwork Crisis. Wall Street was only open Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday for a few hours a day. They were trying to give a chance for the guys on bicycles to get caught up. And it's something like a, a database. If a database gets log jammed and how that ripples out, that happened. It, it took down some brokerages. It took down a large brokerage actually in America that this database ripple at the center of our capital market. So the SEC called the industry together and they proposed a solution. Well, there were two solutions proposed actually. Uh, one was let's have a peer to peer electronic settlement system. The other solution was called central counterparty clearing. And that's where there's just one counterparty to every broker in the market. And anyone, all we have to worry about is count is settlement between that counterparty and every broker. They created a vault, a depository under wall street called CD and Company. Now, this is what's funny. If I were in the room, I would ask you, raise your hand if you own any public stock. And about half the people in the room will put your hand up. And then I would tell you that everyone with your hand up is incorrect. Nobody in the room owns any public stock. Nobody in the room owns any stock in any public company. All the stock in the world, all the stock in every American publicly traded company it's owned by a company you never hear, heard of. It's called CD and Company. It's in New Jersey. And I'm not just talking about they warehouse or they store the stock. They have the legal ownership to all of America, all of corporate America. What they do is they, they have generated what are basically in casino land, it'd be called a marker. They've generated chits, IOUs, contractual claims against those shares called share entitlements. When you're trading stock, all that's really going on is these, con these contractual claims against that stock are swirling around among different parties. All the stock, both the location and the legal ownership is staying with a corporation no one's ever heard of. Literally 98% of the stock of Amer corporate America, publicly traded corporate America, is legally owned by an entity that no one's ever heard of. And all the rest of us have are strings or daisy chains of contractual right. If you're say on in the lower left hand corner, that's your broker. And that broker clears through a broker who clears through another broker who's cleared to the DCCC. And I'm on say the lower right hand corner. If I sell you hundred shares of IBM and you buy hundred shares of IBM, all that's really happening is these different contractual claims are shifting around among parties and everything gets netted and pre-netted and such has nothing to do with any actual property right. What could possibly go wrong? 
what could go wrong is that can log jam. And there's and that's what happened in 2008. And it's sort of this thing that that well, there's a reason Alan Greenspan was talking about it on October 23rd, 2008. So our system log jammed and it log jammed because all you really own when you think you own 100 shares of IBM is you have a contractual claim against a broker who has a contractual claim against another broker who has a contractual claim against another broker who has a contractual claim against the DTCC who has a contractual claim against CD and company who actually owns the stock and there's nothing that says those have to be a one to one relationship so what it is is fractional reserve banking without a reserve requirement and it allows for all kinds of mischief I won't go into. The whole thing, the point is, this is Wall Street as we know it. That can all be, re that, and it, it didn't come out of a burning bush. It's stuff that was created in the 70s. And it's not like anyone was necessarily evil to do it. The technology of peer-to-peer -peer settlement wasn't ready, is what they decided. So they went with this system, which had been tried in Vienna in the 1860s. In 1986, the SEC hired I think he was a retired judge, to look at it all, a guy named Pollock. And he studied this, and he wrote a very disturbing report talking about how bad this was for all kinds of reasons. It could lead to systemic collapse, which is what happened in 2008. And it could lead to, there's different opportunities for mischief. And if you heard about a fight I had 12 years ago with Wall Street, that's what it was about. It wasn't about overstock. It wasn't about, it, it was about, I realized that there were huge opportunities for mischief in this system and including the possibility of a systemic collapse. So that's why Greenspan was saying that. Let's go back to the idea of settlement using a ledger. This ledger is magic. It's cryptographically protected. It's public, transparent. There's copies of it everywhere. We could make money just exist as entries within that ledger. And the, set, the, the cash component of settling, say, grandpa buys a baseball glove from the guy on the right is just some entries in a ledger. That same, that's the concept, of course, behind Bitcoin. You can apply it to Wall Street by adding entries for coins for stocks. And as people buy and sell stock, it's just entries in that cryptographic magic ledger. You could take this whole meshigus and replace it. <laughs> Seems simple. <laughs> Seems simple. That's what I've spent uh, the last four years and about $75 million working on. It's called T0. And that's what we're doing in the stock market. Okay, I'm going to stop there and take, so that's how, uh, two examples of how we can use blockchain to address poverty and mischief. Poverty and global poverty and mischief in Wall Street. Let's go to questions. Thank you. Uh, I just wanted to ask, um, since you were one of the first global retailers to accept crypto, what do you think is holding back the rest of the world and, and large retailers from accepting crypto? And what will it take to get them to start accepting the way Overstock has? Well, actually, let me correct you. We were the first global retailer. Back when we, st uh, there was the largest company in the world. Someone ought to check this. The largest company in the world accepting Bitcoin on December 31st, 2013 was my understanding is it was an $800,000 a year diner in Australia. We stepped in and started taking it. We were a billion three. So we like to think we saved the movement. You know, it would have taken a year or two to get to t someone doing 10 million, then a year or two, someone 100. Yeah. So maybe we like to save it five or six million. We're probably giving ourselves too much credit. Why have not more people done it? You know, it still has a stigma attached to it. I still get asked about XTC dealing and gun running and money laundering. Uh, it's got that, but you know, it really is, there isn't on the demand side. That's really the answer. Only about 0.2% of our sales are in crypto. Maybe half of that or three quarters of that Bitcoin and the other little stub in other altcoins. So people, and I've said that publicly. So the fact that only 0.2% of our sales are in Bitcoin maybe tells people, ah, oh, it's not worth integrating. It's not worth all the trouble and reputational cost. I, I've got a question. Uh, thank you very much for that presentation. And it's very encouraging to hear the way you jumped in and actually changed the trend of the market. 
it, it also suggests that with your heft, perhaps you've got insights into what the next tipping point might be to actually bring, make it more mainstream. Your thoughts? Well, it still is not really integrated in many places. It's a little bit like getting adoption on Apple Pay or something. So we're going to do more. You're going to start seeing us do more. Actually, at the beginning of June, we're introducing an alpha project that will do more to make us um, help us spread bit, uh, crypto. We want to create economic incentives. You know, it's kind of funny. People don't, I think everyone has an economic incentive. It's an insurance policy because of all the systems as they exist, these crazy Keynesian magic money tree multiplier effect magic money tree ever comes crashing down. The goal is to have this robust set of alternative institutions that'll survive. And I feel like I'm in a race against time, building capital markets, building central banking, blockchain central banking, blockchain capital markets, et cetera. So everybody, but you have to create an incentive for people to do it. What happens is when company, when countries, I was just in a pretty lousy country, I won't say its name, and everybody is, is like rushing to crypto. Everybody's in on crypto. It happened in it happened in Cyprus. That's really what what happens is what you know. People wait. They don't buy their insurance policy until uh, they they re read about the hurricane coming. So I think at the end of the day, what's going on in countries is as they get start going pear shaped their economies, you have you have people turn to crypto. If you have any ideas on how do you think we can get that to be accelerated in the United States? and not wait till our dollar crisis. Uh, yes, Patrick, a question. Uh, what is, what is, what is your, your opinion on the deep state's reaction to you and um, whether or not you think that if this threatens the uh, basic military industrial complex structure in the American economy, how is that going to affect um, the progress that you're attempting to make? It's a good question. Uh, I, I think that the U.S. government has an ambivalent attitude towards it. I think maybe it's the case that if the powers that be had it to do again and they could go back seven years in time, they would go back and make all of this illegal, all of this crypt, everything cryptographic, just make it illegal. It's too late now. You know, it's in... Every any math, it's all out in the world on white papers. Any math department at any graduate, uh, any graduate math department at any university in the world can recreate it all. So it can't be stopped. And there are people here who it, get it. There are people here who don't. People who care about systemic risk, in my experience, no matter which institution they're in, they like it. People who are even a lot of regulators like it, they get, it's gonna make their job a lot easier. All kind of, the beautiful thing about that capital market I showed you, all kinds of mischief that goes on on Wall Street can't even go on in a blockchain capital market. That's the funniest thing. It can't go on because the original sin, as by the way, you just had Caitlin Long speak. She's one of the great minds in this field. And her point is that's the original sin when you separate, it's when you separate, when you sh shave the property rights off, it's only when you do that that all kinds of mischief can happen by reuniting the trading with the settlement. It actually makes a whole bunch of mischief impossible. So there's regulators who see that too, and there's politicians who see that. Uh, people have, I think they're torn between two things here. They fear it because they think it is going to disrupt the world as they know it, and it will. I'll get back to that. But on the other hand, they don't want to fall behind. When you know Clinton did something smart, when the internet came along, Bill Clinton, a lot of hands here wanted to regulate it. Clinton stood up against the Democrats and did not regulate it because he knew if he did, China or Russia or someone else would become the boss of it. That's one of the directions things are pulled here in DC. And that has been amplified by the fact that China came out two years ago, a year and a half ago with their newest five-year plan and in their newest five-year plan, they name three or four technologies they want to be the dominate the world. And at the end of this five years, blockchain is the first of them. So I think once the U.S. 
saw that, the politicians saw that, and the regulators and stuff. Everybody's scared to death of stopping it. Actually, I'll be honest. I mean, I've never said a nice thing about about D.C. in my life, but I do have to say the I what I've seen in the last six months to a year is very good and encouraging and professional. People, it's almost I so I've met with different people, and some of it's in the newspapers. I'm not going to go through it, but I've met with different people, uh, some are under duress and some not. I've had lots of conversations. It seems to me Washington wants to play what they say anyway is they want to play a constructive role and don't want it to be able to help terrorism. And so they want to make sure their AML, KYC instincts are assuaged, and that's their prerogative. I know that bothers some, would bother some libertarians, but they do have, anti, they do have terrorism to worry about. Um, so anyway, that's how, uh, I'm not sure that, so the deep state, the deep state I think is afraid to stop this because if they stop it, China gets it all. That's what's crazy. China's right out there on our tail. They are building all these systems too. Even though they're locking it down in China and they've made it illegal, they made it mining illegal. So the only people mining in China are the people really connected to the government in some way and have government connections. And I mean, different ways people are finding around the rules. But basically, they're cracking down in China on, on Bitcoin, but they want to be masters of blockchain technology. They're creating things to distribute around the world. And if the Chinese get it, you know, we can live with maybe with Chinese, everything running on Chinese transistors. We don't want, uh, or, or chips or something, we don't want an, any authoritarian government to have control of the underlying technology of blockchain. And if the U.S. backs off this, it is, we become a, it becomes a Chinese world. Everyone starts learning Chinese because it'll be a Chinese world. Because the Chinese will conquer the world with blockchain if the U.S. government uh, tries to slow it down here. Sad to say, I'm not in favor of that. I have a, a question um, that with um, deflation, there's a, one of the problems with deflation, which I think is somewhat natural, is that there's a liquidity problem. So, for example, if I can use one U.S. dollar to buy a car, um, how do I buy a cup of, of coffee? But uh, with something like uh, blockchain or Bitcoin, it's infinitely divisible. So gold isn't. If you keep dividing gold, it, essentially the molecule is no longer gold. But with a blockchain or with something that is structured um, like Bitcoin is, I could buy a cup of coffee with like one billionth of a Bitcoin eventually. So there's never, there's never the excuse to inflate the currency um, for, the, for the purpose of liquidity. And I've never heard anybody talk about that. And I'm wondering if somebody has and if there's something I can read about that. But I think that's one of the really attractive things to me. Interesting. Well, Bitcoin actually does have some limit. It goes out, I think it's eight digits. So what would that be? A hundred million. I think it breaks up into a hundred million cents, one Bitcoin. But of course, that's that's not fixed. If they had to, they could take it out further. Um, people have been attracted to the deflationary aspect of, of Bitcoin. I think there's more deflation than probably Satoshi planned on, frankly. There's something called uh, bit rot, which is you know some number of people every day who own Bitcoin get, uh, you know, get sick or die or lose a key or get disinterested in Bitcoin and, or whatever. And or get Alzheimer's and they don't remember their key. And for that reason, there are there is coinage that is just rotting. And so there's probably a bit higher factor of deflation within Bitcoin than had originally been planned, incidentally. Just I don't know, I forget what the number is offhand, but the calculations show it may actually be a, a sharply deflationary or, uh, you know, it's not insignificant. Other than that, uh, no, but you ought to you ought to look up um, see, see how many digits Bitcoin breaks into, and so I don't think that is the case that we're infinite, by the way. But next question. Two quick questions. First of all, what should we do with our stock? Those of us who own stock, and the second one is I don't understand. I understand how Bitcoin is secured because you got these miners that are going to make a lot of money either by getting a new coin or by charging 
um, to put a block, you know, put, put, put the transactions in a block. But how do all these other chains um, encourage uh, people to make nodes and to uh, secure the network, especially your property uh, title system? Well, different systems uh, for different coins, people have different theories, and some of them are private ledgers where there's a private corporation which does maintain uh, the system. Uh, there, there's different models, proof of work, proof of stake. I'll mention one that is of great interest to me, and I'm just now have been given permission to talk about it. It's called Ravencoin. Raven as in Edgar Allan Poe, the Raven. It is an open source project that launched on January 3rd. Uh, actually, it launched on October 31st, and the first, the Genesis block was mined on January 3rd. Those are the dates that Satoshi himself chose. So no one can complain. Pre-mining and all kinds of, there's all kinds of mischief that can go on in our field too. But by keeping to Satoshi's dates and such, there's no pre-mining. It was an adequate amount of time. It has spread faster in terms of number of nodes, far faster than anything in history. I think it may already be in the top 10 in hashing power. I heard like number six or something. It's only three or four months old. I don't know if that, that sounds, I don't know. I, don't quote me on that, but, uh, uh, but it is up to 12,000 nodes. It's a fork or an evolution of Bitcoin, but it's 10 times more informational efficient. There's 10 times, the blocks are 10 times bigger and the energy is a thousand times more. And it's trading at four cents a coin. Now you can either, Oh, and what's very interesting about it, but if I make you rich on this, re you know, remember, remember this moment, this is four cents a coin. Now it, there's an argument. It's better than Bitcoin and or Ethereum. Uh, it's called Raven coin. Once again, it's very interesting because it's ASICs resistant. You know, there's CPUs, GPUs, and ASICs. And ASICs are, are chips with dedicated circuits dedicated to one, to one algorithm. Well, the algorithm, the question, the mathematical question that runs underneath Bitcoin, people built ASICs chips for, and they're so much more efficient than that. That's, they dominate, everyone mining Bitcoin uses these rigs. Well, Ravencoin runs on a on 16 different math problems, and those math problems vary randomly, and they are you have you need the, the answer to one problem to start the next problem. Because of that, you can't make an ASICs chip. I think the most circuits everyone anyone ever put on an ASICs chip is three, maybe four. You couldn't put 16 circuits on. So there's no way to do do this with an ASICs chip. Because of that. It means you don't have a disadvantage to be back just on your game, on your GPUs. That fact is, there's some very interesting, this, this Raven coin, and I know one of the big thinkers who was part of the movement, he's a tricky guy, clever guy, and this kind of hacks, this is a hack, but not a, not a hack, I mean a metaphorical hack. They've kind of hacked through a bunch of the problems uh, around the crypto community. Take a look into something called Ravencoin. Patrick, um, Steve Sadler, a quick question for you. If you look at your T0 platform, and I guess we went through a couple years ago, the regulation A hopefulness, where we thought capital markets would be more free and open to smaller companies raising capital. How do you see the T0 ICO opportunity, uh, and then what's your view on Let's call it the regulatory overlords stepping in to, to kibosh. Well, let me let me take those. Uh, let me reverse those. Here's the regulatory situation. I'm going to shock you because while a libertarian, I'm a small L libertarian. I don't think we want to be too ideological. And here's one example. We used to live in a country where people drove around with a suitcase full of stock certificates, penny stock flim flam, and they would stop at some farm, guy stops at some farm and swindles a widow out of her farm and returns for some phony stock certificates. So 1933, we passed these laws that say if you're raising money from the public, you have to do things. You have to create a, you got to write a prospectus, 
lawyers and accountants have to check it all out and certify the government has to look at it and say, yes, this prospectus fairly describes this business and then you take this and you give it to the public and you sell and, and stock and you raise capital. Now, a libertarian is going to say, why, you know, that's big brother or that's paternalism. Why does the government get to do that? I'll just tell you that before we had this system, everyone was getting swindled all the time. And now maybe it'd be better to have that than to have the mayor planning a sign saying beach is safe for swimming when in fact it isn't safe for swimming. I don't know. But if I can tell you if you're... I'm as libertarian as the next guy, and we like to think that the invisible hand will take care of things. But the truth is the financial industry draws more than its fair share of swindlers. That's because the nature of every financial business is give me money now, I'll do something in the future. So anyway, so that's the rule. I thought that by a year ago, people were going to be all over the idea of using blockchain coins to do shares of stock. But a year ago, this thing happened instead, the ICO movement, initial coin offering, which is selling utility tokens. It was people going out and raising money from the public for a business idea and, and really dis distorting it and saying, there's, there's ways you could reframe this business idea. And I'm going to walk you through an example because this is actually quite important in terms of understanding what's going on now. If I come to your town and say, I'm going to set up a video or game parlor and I've got this parlor and I've put in 20 video games and I, those, I've got a million of those little brass tokens you buy and I'll sell them to you in town for 700,000. And I'm doing that to sort of get people interested and get you coming in with your tokens and using my video games and maybe we'll prime the pump. That's just a pre-sale of those tokens. But suppose, okay, I'm going to sell you these million dollars worth of tokens. I'll take your $700,000 and then I'm going to go out with the 700000 and buy a bunch of video games and find a place to put them and I'll open a store. At some point, that's it. Uh, you're really buying those on an expectation of some future benefit. And back on July 25th of last year, the SEC, in my view, correctly said that's a security. If you do that, and they were ruling on the Dow token, they said that's the security. The fact that there's, it's, you're not able to use the tokens today, you're able to use them in the future, that makes it a security. And so what people were doing last year felt to me like they drove down a cul-de-sac. They went in this cul-de-sac called ICOs. Instead of using blockchain to do securities, they said, we're going to come up with these business models where we can kind of say, we're selling these tokens that you're going to be able to use in video games in the future. And that's how we're going to capitalize our business. So that's not a security. We're just pre-selling tokens. That's what the, the SEC came in on July 25th and said, with regard to one company that was over the line. In December, they did, they did another company. And then just a couple months ago, the SEC chairman, Clayton, came out and said something funny like the truth is every security token I've ever seen. Every utility token I've ever seen is really a security, meaning all thousand of those that came out last year broke the law. They were out there raising money from the public and they were ignoring all those laws about 19 from 33 and 34. I don't know what's going to happen with them. However, what we I believe that that means anyone you're nuts. If you're nuts, if you violate those laws, by the way, because what they do, if you raise money from the public and you don't follow the rules, you take that money, you build a successful business, 20 years later, they can show up and take your business and just unwind the whole thing. They unwind it all and they find the original people and get them money back. And believe it or not, they do that. So it doesn't matter if your business works or not. You're nuts if you violate that law. And all these thousand businesses or more which raise all this capital, I think they're, they're kidding themselves if they think they're not gonna have trouble in the future. Uh, it can happen 20 years down the road. So, uh, however, it's undeniable, you know, Bob Greifeld, the retired chairman and CEO of NASDAQ came out in November and said 100, per, no, he said 100% of the stocks and bonds being sold on wall street today could be tokenized. And in five years, 100% of the stocks and bonds on wall street will be tokenized. That's saying that the plumbing of wall street is going to be deprecated over the next five years. 
all that crazy red cloud that I was showing you is going to go away and it's going to be replaced by blockchain. I mean, that's what he was saying. The ch chairman of NASDAQ, the retired chairman of NASDAQ, that's what he was saying. And what I hope he's right, because what we've done is we built the replacement. And I don't think I don't I think the SEC is OK with this. I mean, I'm sorry. I, oh, I should say I'm under SEC investigation. I think this is investigation number seven <laughs> and in my life. And uh, I expected it that when we started, you know, building a whole alternative Wall Street, they would show up and want to know about it. So and they don't they they've made clear to me that the only thing they like said uh, when you're under SEC investigation is I'm under SEC investigation. I'm under federal investigation. It's the seventh time in my life I can say that, by the way. <laughs> okay, next question. Thank you very much, Patrick, for speaking with us. And uh, number seven is lucky, so I hope that one goes well for you. Uh, both from your speech and from Caitlin's speech, we've all learned that we're crazy to invest in Wall Street. Uh, that being said, however, should we be investing in Overstock.com or other companies? And is the developmental work you're doing with blockchain utilities something that uh, is associated with Overstock or with a different company? And are there, I guess one final question, are there other companies in the blockchain space that you think are worthy of investing in for those of us crazy enough? Uh, I I certainly cannot comment on should you invest or not invest in Overstock. Um, I've already got enough headaches with Washington without that. Uh, all the blockchain stuff we are doing is within Wall with is within Overstock. It's Stockus and it owns this blockchain. It's Medici and Medici has twelve investments in blockchain. Just one of them is T zero. So there's some other very exciting ones in there. There's also sixty five million or seventy million Raven coins. Pretty interesting. We, uh, which is in the notes, it's out there in the public. Nobody's figured out, you know, and that only has a few million dollars of value now. Uh, who knows if it ever does more? So, but anyway, everything I've described to you is within Overstock. Yes. Patrick uh, Hunter Hastings here. You said you said at the beginning that this could be a civilizational moment, and you talked about uh, with Dr. DeSoto eliminating terrorism uh, through blockchain entrepreneurship. Could you say a little bit more about your vision for the civilization effect of blockchain? Sure. Here's the deep, the deep meaning, I think. For 6,000 years, we, as we go about consensual exchange, have had this problem to solve of trust. You can't trust me I don't, if I don't know you, you and you don't know me. I can't, we can't trust each other. So I go to buy a camel from you, and I'm going to give you this gold coin. You don't know if you can trust me. Did I debase the coin or not? So we create an institution like a mint, and who has monopoly on violence and attack, and an oasis puts his face on the, the coins and says, "Anyone who debases this, I kill." That's a way to mon that's a business model, a way to monetize his monopoly on violence. But it's an institution that lets us, that creates trust so you and I can go about our camel for gold coin exchange. Same thing with land titling. We can't trust each other, but there's one office, the land titling office. So when you buy a piece of land from uh, me and I give you that piece of paper and it gets registered there, you know it's trustworthy. I was in five years ago, I was in a company in Silicon Valley that had uh, 160 industries written on a wall that really had that same common denominator, or I'd say it functions or institutions in society that have that common denominator. They're there to inject trust so strangers can in conduct exchange. Well, for 6,000 years, we accumulated those institutions like barnacles. And depending on the country and the time, some of those institutions we are government and some are private. But the, they all have that same, con they have this common denominator. Now, though, we can achieve that trust between parties using cryptography, using tokenization and cryptography. Exchange becomes totally trustworthy, <clears throat> which means we have turned in, you know, 
it's like becoming a buggy whip manufacturer. We have made into buggy whip manufacturers all those 160 institutions that accumulated over 6,000 years. And I mean from notary public to even tax collector or to Visa card, et cetera, et cetera. We've made cryptography properly lined up with tokens and such. All this crypto stuff means we can achieve that without those institutions. Well, here's the funny part. If you're a liberal, a classic a philosophical liberal, you remember that those institutions, we don't live to serve them. They're just things we created so we could go about our pursuits of life, liberty, property, happiness. We, we created them and now we don't need them. So it's gonna be a really funny time because what the internet did to publishing, I think crypto is going to do to, a, to 160 institutions that we accumulated over 6,000 years. In fact, I think it's so big, I actually worry. I worry about the story of Frankenstein. Remember, Frankenstein wasn't the monster. The monster was the monster. Frankenstein was the doctor who was so enamored, the young scientist so crazy about what he could do with science that he didn't give any thought to the ramifications. Well, you know, civilization as we know it has grown up and around these hundred plus institutions that they're the glue that bind everything together and make it work. Blockchain is like a corrosive acid to that glue. We don't need them. And I, I, I'm an incrementalist. I want to see it unwind slowly because I think lots of bad things happen when things snap. Thank you very much, Patrick. Um, I had a question on the uh, let's let's just take an example of the uh, uh, solution to poverty uh, that that you're working towards. Um, let's say that we do get uh, titling of say land uh, farms in say Tanzania or South Africa or something like that, and now we have you know uh, the the title uh, cannot be corrupted or or changed through a corrupt uh, government official or something like that, and now we have a worldwide network where that title can be used as collateral to provide uh, that someone can borrow against and things like that. But my question is, it seems like there's kind of a missing link where um, if, if you don't have uh, a, a good, uh, I don't know, police force or what you want to call it on the ground, that when, you know, say, the, say that the loan is not repaid and I need to collect that collateral, um, I can't actually get it because there's... Uh, there's a new gang in town that says, well, actually, that title is not valid here. It's, it's not worth anything. How do you kind of uh, uh, move from that technology, you know, the good blockchain technology, to the actual boots on the ground that might make that contract enforceable? Well, we do want, at some point, the informal ledgers, which we surface using this technology, to be recognized by government. In some cases, that's going to be us hiring law firms in the country and fighting and demonstrating that what we have surfaced meets. And by the way, before anyone can dig, before a, a Western company can go and do business and dig a hole in the ground somewhere, since 1940, there have been laws in the U.S. and Canada, this whole string by international treaty, by national, by local, boom, boom. So part of our work is going to be servicing these and representing and getting government to acknowledge. <clears throat> but we think it's going to come as much from that governments are going to cooperate with us. We can do this without them. <clears throat> but we think if we go to the, the government of a country in the Middle East with 40 million people and say, we can show you where 15 million people, if you will title them, we can show we can we can surface where 15 million people live and they will register and they will register their land and start paying taxes so on and so forth if you will commit to titling them. Hernando de Soto can do that. 10 million people in Peru have titled to land because of what he did for them back then. So we, you know, we think we can do that. And in fact, the early, I got to tell you, the organizations that are calling me and asking me to come and do this in their countries convince me that we're not going to have as big a, that big a problem. Maybe we will, and we'll have to hire a bunch of law firms in different countries and fight. But the point is, it's almost like being a union leader. I used to work for Buffett. And when I worked for Buffett, I ran a group of companies that were in a union fight. And I learned the union model. And the union model is kind of interesting. You hire you know, some 
some college kids for next to nothing and you get them to live in a crummy motel in Odessa, Texas for six weeks and sign, get folks in some 500, 800 person plant to sign a card and you turn them into a union, you're going to start collecting about a million bucks a year from them. It's about every three or four years, you have to send a suit down to renegotiate a contract for a week. But you know, it's, you spend 20,000, 30,000 up front and then you get this wonderful annuity. It's a very lovely business. I wish I could go invest in being a union. Uh, unfortunately, we can't, we capitalists. But anyway, what my sense is kind of what we're doing is like that. We are organize, we'll be organizing the voices of tens of millions of people and hiring the best law firms, like the Cravath, Swain and Moore of Uruguay and the Cravath, Swain and Moore of, you know, uh, whatever, uh, Ivory Coast and, and bringing this stuff to the government and, and fighting and getting it done. However, I really don't, because governments are calling and leaders are calling. I don't think it's going to be that hard. I think we're going to be doing it in some places, you know, with, with government agreement before we even have to go in and before we even go in, they may already be agreeing that what we surface, they will recognize. Hi, Patrick, uh, Sean Lynch. Um, both you and Caitlin have talked about uh, blockchain as tracking ownership of uh, either cryptocurrency or stocks or, or property or whatever, but blockchain doesn't tie uh, anything to a human being. It ties it to a private, whoever controls a private key, right? And key management is one of the hardest problems in the interaction between human, uh, humans and computers, right? It's why we don't use cryptography uh, with you know long-lived uh, private keys for the most part. Like PGP hasn't taken off for this reason. So what what's your plan with T0 to help people in countries that don't even have well-developed legal systems uh, actually manage their private keys and not get fished, not get their private keys stolen and their property thus stolen without having to resort to central solutions? Well, first of all, let me let me go back a step. I do think there's going to be a place in the ecosystem for corporations. Like, for example, in our stock exchange, in our T0, we could have built T0 so you didn't – so it's the exchange and you don't need brokers. Everyone just has a wallet with the exchange. Our understanding is the regulators don't want to see, that's, don't want to see that happen because they don't want exchanges to be doing AML, KYC, and customer service when grandma loses a stock certificate or a key, having to deal with it. So there's still going to be a ring of brokers around the exchange who, who do handle those functions. And I think that's a pretty good description of where the corporate evolution is going to go around this. There's all kinds of people seeing themselves getting disrupted. <clears throat> this is an extinction event for a lot of the financial industry as we know it, but some of the dinosaurs will evolve into birds, successful birds. And that's to me, the avenue they evolve is to focus on all those customer services and, and not fight to defend all the back office that blockchain can replace. When you go overseas, well, first of all, we're gonna, we do everything AML KYC, because I don't wanna go to jail. And I've had enough, I've had seven federal investigations, and if I do anything wrong, the feds are gonna bury me under a prison. So they're not just gonna put me in prison, they're gonna bury me under a prison. So I, uh, I'm keen on doing things AML KYC. <laughs> Uh, and, but in the, you know, it's interesting and in poor countries, maybe 10 people, 10%, 15% of people have a bank account, but 140% of people have a cell phone because everybody has a cell phone. Every, some people have two. And that's really the magic. It's been for decades, this discussion of the problem of the unbanked, the, that have bank accounts and they're cut off from the global economy and all that stuff. But since everyone has a cell phone, the more we can move this onto cell phones. So, for example, <clears throat> once you have land, you have capital. That was Hernando de Soto's point. Once you have the land, you have capital. Then we introduce, in Barbados, we have the world's leading blockchain meets central bank company. It's called BIT, B-I-T-T, 35% of BIT. <clears throat> we have a central bank and a laptop. We can go into a central bank. We've got two, we, actually, uh, Barbados and the Eastern Caribbean Central Bank, which covers eight other countries in the Caribbean, are have now signed up. 
and it's, it's live in Barbados and we're doing things in the ECCB. So suppose, so for example, I'll tell you one African country, a well-known African country contacted us recently, the first advisor to the president. And we walked him through this and he told me we want to, as soon as possible, to have that DeSoto thing. And then we want our central bank to be, to go on bit. And then, and once you have everybody on bit, bit also includes as a central bank in a laptop and everyone just downloads a mobile app onto their phone. So money just becomes, it, it's on your phone. This is live in Barbados. You can walk into a chicken shop in Barbados and buy a drumstick, which is my test, with money on your phone that's not tied to any bank account anywhere. It's just digital beige and dollars. And soon there'll be eight other countries with digital ECCB dollars. And soon there'll be other countries. Now, once you have that, and this is this is so magical to me, and I'll this, this this is a big thought. This is my big thought for the day. You can have a on top of that. Suppose we introduce a peer to peer lending app. So those poor people, you know, Hernando thinks that when you do this, if we could actually globalize up the five billion people's ledgers, it frees many tens of trillion dollars, maybe hundreds of trillions of dollars of wealth of capital into existence. If you have peer to peer lending app. And, well, if you have digital currency and then you have a peer-to-peer, -peer, which we're also building, and then a peer-to-peer -peer lending app, those mean that means those five billion poor people can start saving and borrowing and lending and sharing capital in a way it, they can start doing it immediately. What's so funny about that is for 70 years, and I'll close this answer on this note, I used to study development economics and they used to talk about how much uh, how many tens of millions of tons of copper it was going to take to wire up India? It tells you how old I was. But back, how many phones, a phone in every home in India, how many tens of millions of tons of copper? Then, of course, eight years later, cell phone came along and they realized they weren't going to do that anymore. Well, for 70 years, the West has been telling the developing world, look at our institutions and copy them. Our Wall Street and copy them. Our DTCC, copy it our banking institutions and you copy and here you have these countries you know doing the equivalent of laying cable delay i mean lay, digging digging holes and trenches to lay copper cable that's what they're doing well now we can go into the laptop and give them the world's most advanced land titling system while well, a laptop and everybody downloads a mobile app we give them another laptop and they have the world's most advanced central bank that they can micro adjust and an unbelievable surveillance of their economic activity and perfect adjustment. They can program in the Taylor rule if they want. And then you layer on top of that a peer to peer lending app, all which just people download on their phones. Suddenly you have all the functionality of the most advanced Western countries, uh, land and capital money and capital formation processes. And you have it without any opportunities for mischief. It's all ironclad, immutable, cryptographically protected, pure. Uh, that's what I think. And, and, and you don't have to spend another 70 years building copies of our Citibank and our JP Morgan. And not that they, they would, you know, that they should. I mean, it means that they can, it's like inventing the cell phone and they can skip the, all the, the 50 million pounds of, or tons of copper wire. That's what blockchain does. And that's why I think it is, it, you know, the Bible says the poor ye shall always have with you. Well, maybe not. I think that if the sort of thing works, a billion people can start practicing capitalism between consenting adults. And we all know what that's going to do for the world if it happened. So you just mentioned, uh, Patrick, one of the advantages to, uh, say, a government adopting this digital currency being surveillance. Uh, I, I find that uh, remark profoundly disturbing. I don't want people to be able to be surveilled. This, this to me is one reason, you know, if, if we can have blockchain technology where it's really in the hands of, of the people and it's uh, anonymous and governments can't track it, great. But, uh, you know, if it's going to become something that they can track, we're better off sticking with uh, old-fashioned cash, I think. Good point. I was using surveillance of there's a lot more fudge in the numbers that get reported 
in the United States about what's just the uh, the statistics that get reported about our economy. There's I think there's more slop in that. I think, for example, they have been deliberately understating inflation for years. I think all kinds of games get played in that, but also I think they just don't know. I think that the that the government's understanding of economic activity is Im, is imprecise. It's not precise. So for those for those who think that they should be managing that, one of the selling points is they can manage the money supply and, uh, and they can understand the flows of money and manage the money supply much better with blockchain than what the, the system they do now. I believe they will learn that they can. That's the sense in which I meant surveillance. Does blockchain increase the other, the uh, what is it called, the Patriot Act kind of surveillance? Well, the fran- frankly, I don't think it increases it. It does make the uh, once th- things are digital, it does make everything digital, you know, immutable, and the government can find it some someday. But you know what? You're kidding yourself if you think it doesn't now. You know, unless you're living on cash, 97 percent of transactions in America, I believe, do not involve cash. 90 something. Uh, last I heard. It, then then it's all being kept. It's all being stored. Where you're sitting right now and who you're sitting next to is stored. A year from now, they can find out who was in the room from, you know, unless you all turned off your cell phones. So if you're using credit cards now or Apple Pay now or anything like that, you, everything's being tracked. Now, that's not to say anybody is doing it, but everything is being recorded. Blockchain doesn't make that any worse. And, you know, if you if you want to survive on cash, uh, you can rip up your visa card. I mean, you can always have cash outside your visa card and you can always have cash outside the blockchain. But uh, in any case, that's not the sense in which I meant surveillance. I just meant in the sense of uh, the Bureau of Economic Statistics trying to figure out what's actually going on in the economy so they can manage it better. Um, I don't think they should be. But anyway, for this is a selling point when I'm talking to conventional Conventional people, not people from the Mises Institute. Hey, Patrick Byrne, thank you so much for your time. Ladies and gentlemen, big round of applause.